The scary stories will begin in 25 seconds. There's only two mid-roll ads in this video, one after story number one, and one more after story number two. So if you would like to show your support, please subscribe to my channel and hit the thumbs up. It helps me more than you know. Now, let's begin. During my early 20s, I worked as a meter reader in Iowa City, Iowa. A meter reader is the person who records how much electricity, gas, or water you've used each month. If your meters are on the inside and you want an accurate bill, a meter reader must enter your home, whether you're there to let them in or not. Entering a home when the owner isn't present is something that I never got used to. No matter how loudly I knocked, I never shook the uneasy feeling that I wasn't welcome. The inside of a home is the ultimate private space. A home's exterior is just the image of ourselves that we project to the rest of the world. But the further you venture inside, the closer you come to truly seeing what kind of person lives there. And if you want the raw, unfiltered truth, head for the basement. I hate basements. I have seen walls that looked like giant, static-filled TV screens until I realized it was roaches scurrying across a white background, cobwebs so thick and dusty that it looked like a cotton candy machine exploded at the Spider County Fair. I have seen rats, snakes, feces, weapons, neglected children, homeless squatters, massive hordes, and even a coffin. There are rational explanations for all of these things. Well, maybe not the coffin, but there was one basement where what I found was beyond the grasp of logic. And that's what made it so terrifying. It was an old apartment house. From the outside, it looked like every other house on the block. I entered the back door and found myself at the top of a staircase. I ran my hand along the wall until it grazed a light switch. I flipped the switch, but no lights turned on. I wasn't carrying a flashlight. A typical route involved five or six hours of walking, so I carried as little as possible. Oftentimes, I used the light from my handheld screen, but it only illuminated whatever was about a foot in front of it. So armed with the world's worst lantern, I made my way down into the darkness. Once at the bottom, I blindly shuffled across the room, one baby step at a time, with arms outstretched and head down. I eventually reached the far side of the basement. I shined the dim light from my handheld along the wall and discovered two doors. Each door led into its own small room. I chose the door on the right and found the meters in the far corner. As I entered the reeds, I began hearing noises coming from the other room. Something was moving, and there was whimpering that grew louder the longer I listened. I eventually realized it was a dog. It sounded weak and distressed. I tried to open the door, but it was locked. At this point, the dog was scratching the other side of the door. I felt helpless. I reported it when I got back to the office, but I couldn't shake the thought of that dog. It stuck with me over the next month until it was time to return. So there I was, one month later, back within that basement. At least this time I knew where the meters were located. I shuffled back to the little room on the right, while keeping my ears open for any sounds coming from the other room. This time I heard nothing. I read the meters and started making my way back, but I couldn't shake the memory of that dog. Was it still trapped inside that room? My curiosity got the best of me. I stood outside the door for a few moments, listening. Still nothing. That's when I made a huge mistake. I tried to open the door. I had no more than jiggled the doorknob when I first heard it. Screams. Blood-curdling screams. Unlike anything I had ever heard. Sounds that I did not think a human was capable of producing. Short, piercing, high-pitched shrieks, followed abruptly by a low, drawn-out, guttural moan that ultimately morphed 
into something that I can only describe as crying, but much louder. It was all over the place, like some sort of psychotic freeform jazz. I stumbled backwards, nearly losing my balance. I shouted something like, Hello? Who's in there? There was no response. Just screams. Are you okay? Do you need help? Still no response. Just screams. There was no doubt that I yelled loud enough for him to hear me. He didn't want my help. He wanted me gone. I fumbled my way through the darkened room, toward the exit. When I reached the top of the stairs, I just stood there listening. I was trying to wrap my mind around what I was hearing. I waited for the screaming to stop, but it never did. When I finally left, it was still as loud and demented as when it began. I felt relieved, but that quickly vanished when I realized I had to do it all over again next month. I reported what I'd heard, but nothing came of it. As my return drew nearer, a sense of dread grew inside of me. What kind of lunatic sits alone in total darkness and silence? My mind created endless explanations for what kind of hell laid beyond that door. By the time I returned, I had built him up in my mind so much that anyone other than the devil himself would have been a letdown. But there was no sign of him the next month, or even the next several months. I had nearly given up on solving the mystery, when a stroke of luck pulled me back in. One night, I went to a concert with a friend, Laura. After the show, I gave her a ride home. She had moved somewhat recently, so she had to give me directions. I didn't pay much attention to where she was leading me, until she pointed to a house a ways up the street. I couldn't believe it. She had moved into the house with the mysterious room in the basement. This sounds weird, but have you noticed anything odd about the basement at this? I began to ask, but before I could finish my sentence, she blurted out. A crazy guy lives down there. Finally, I had confirmation. She went on to tell me that even though her apartment was in the attic, she often heard him yelling late at night. But that wasn't all. She had actually met him. One day, while walking to her car, she saw him standing on the lawn. He stood perfectly still, with no expression on his face. He was directly in her path, so she cautiously made her way around him. She noticed he was staring at her, so she offered a friendly, Hi, as she passed. He had no reaction, except for one unsettling exception. He stuck out his tongue, then quickly sucked it back into his mouth and resumed acting like a statue. Thoroughly creeped out, she got in her car and drove away. Two or three months later, I finally met him myself. I entered the back door like I had so many months before. This time something was different. There was a light on in the basement. I peered down the staircase. At the bottom, a ragged-looking dog was staring back at me. It was the same dog I had heard during my first visit. Then I noticed something else. Behind the dog, I could see a pair of bare feet. The ceiling blocked my view of the rest of whoever was standing there. But it didn't matter. I knew it was him. I should have left right then. But I didn't. I know this probably doesn't make sense, but at this point... My desire to finally get some answers outweighed my fear. I shakily called out, Meter reader, and started to make my descent. As I made my way down, more of him was revealed. He looked to be middle-aged. His head was shaved, and his eyes were wild. He was wearing pants but no shirt. What I remember most was how lean his body looked. It had the look of a body that was never at rest. I explained who I was and what I was doing there. To my surprise, not only did he talk to me, but he actually sounded somewhat normal. The volume and pitch of his voice was odd, but he said the same sorts of things that people typically said to meter readers. 
I even started to doubt whether or not he was the same man I had heard screaming, but his behavior slowly removed all doubt. As I read the meters, he rapidly paced back and forth. He was constantly wringing his hands together and spastically cocking his head from side to side. The longer he talked, the more agitated he became. He began grimacing, and little verbal tics started popping up in his speech. Every so often he would blurt out a loud, Ah! in the middle of a sentence. He was trying to suppress these sounds, but he was losing the battle. I started to make my way to the exit. He followed. His verbal outbursts grew louder and more frequent. I was petrified. When I reached the stairs, I drew our conversation to an end and said goodbye. As I turned to head up the staircase, he could no longer hold it in. Screams. The very same unforgettable screams that I had heard coming from the locked room. I ran up the stairs as fast as my legs would carry me, flung the door open, and rushed back into the daylight. A month or two later, I had a couple friends, including Lara, over to my place. I was excited to tell her about my encounter, but as I was relaying what happened, I could tell that something else was on her mind. When I finished telling my story, she told me about something she had seen a couple weeks earlier. One day, she noticed lights flashing outside her window. She looked outside just in time to see police officers placing the man from the basement in the back seat of a squad car. She later found out from another tenant that he had attacked someone with a knife. That was the last we ever saw of him. I don't know what became of the man in the basement. I like to think that he got the help he needed, but maybe that's just because I'd rather not think about the alternative. I live in an apartment building that has four apartments on each floor. The apartments are split into two groups by something we call a bubble. Basically, two apartments share this bubble, and there is a metal door guarding them before each tenant goes to their own doors. My husband works as a doctor, so he had to go to work for his night shift. I usually do house chores when he goes to work, so the house is clean when he comes back in the morning. I turn on the Scary Stories in the Rain podcast on my Xbox and do my work. I have two cats, Zena, who is five years old, and Marcel, who is three months old, that are usually very playful during nighttime. At one point, they both stop from chasing each other and stare at the door without moving or blinking. Zena, my eldest, having her back curled and silently hissing under the door. She never expresses such behavior. She is the chillest and laid-back cat there is, so having her react like this made me very curious. At the same time, one of the stories that I was listening to was about home invaders and how most times said invaders will check on the houses they want to break into and learn the owner's schedules and such before breaking in. This made me feel very insecure, and I turned the volume lower in order to hear what was going on on the other side of my door which, by the way, it is impossible to get to unless you unlock the first metal door, which has the sole purpose of extra protection for my and my neighbor's apartment. My neighbor is a lonely old lady that has two cats of her own and is, ironically, the building manager. It must have been around midnight, and she was most likely asleep by that time. I turn the volume to my TV down and go closer to the door, having Xena still not move from her position. Pressing my ear against the door searching for sounds, I couldn't hear much except a distinguished sound of heavy breathing, like an alcoholic breathing heavily. It gave me goosebumps, and I immediately started looking around the house for something to defend myself with in a worst-case scenario, thinking that if he broke past the metal door all by himself, then my apartment door might not be a challenge for him, I took my husband's baseball bat and held onto it with my life. I took my cats and hid them in the cupboard under the sink. I don't know why. I don't have children yet, but that's what came to my mind first. And I went back to the door. I opened the peephole to look at the person breathing through my door at midnight, 
and my heart sunk to my stomach. All I could see was an eye, a very veiny, red, and popped out eye staring back at me, right into my soul, followed by repeated and faster breathing, as if whoever it was knew I was watching back. I didn't move or make a sound, hoping that it would make the creep go away, but that was not the case. Even when I moved back from the door, I see the doorknob moving frantically. He was trying to get inside, murmuring something that I couldn't make out, as if on a frenzy. I freeze, holding the baseball bat to my shoulder level, basically preparing myself to bash out this guy's head if he managed to get inside. As he was trying desperately to get inside, fighting with both the doorknob and the keyhole because I could hear noises coming from the keyhole, an idea came to mind. I rush to the living room which is very close to the entrance door and blast out the Scary Story podcast. Luckily, the specific story was narrated by a man with a very heavy voice, and from the outside, it almost sounded like there was someone inside the apartment having a conversation, mostly a monologue. I live in a country where English is not a native language, and few people speak it. At last, what I prayed would work actually did. The moment I blasted the volume to max, the doorknob stopped moving, the breathing ceased, and I went back to the door and checked the peephole for that creepy man. He was no longer there, but the metal outside door was wide open. Of course, my neighbor only now wakes up from my podcast, basically screaming in my house, asking me to turn it down. I tell her what happened and how come she hasn't heard anything. She said she had her TV on as well, and she sleeps with it on, so she didn't feel alone, and didn't hear the conundrum going on in the hallway between our apartments. We both examined the metal door, asking each other if we left it open, even called my husband at work to ask him the same thing, and he told me he locked it twice, as usual. I don't know what I would have done if this expert in door breaking actually managed to break into my house but I do think he was in for the worst for me and my cats. I never thought that, of all the possibilities of salvation, these Scary Story podcasts would be what saved my life. Thank you, Being Scared narrator, for indirectly, of course, saving my life. I have a couple of stories to tell here, all of them involving my family's cabin in Wyoming. So for starters, I need to put this into context. I was born and raised in South Dakota, and if you ever look at a map of it, you'll see that it's a great beige, almost rectangle, with a singular circle of green, right on the west side of this state. That's where I grew up. Now the west side of South Dakota has some pretty amazing sights and it kind of makes up for there being nothing to do here. But in my opinion, nothing here holds a candle to the cabin. The cabin is exactly what it sounds like. A log cabin with no running water, a well, and a creek adjacent. The only modernity it has is electricity, and that was added in the 1930s. It's an hour away from my hometown, and if you die up there, there is no chance you will ever be found, so it's my favorite place to go. It was great when I was stressed from high school and just needed to get away, and now that I'm 25, it's my favorite place to unwind after a long week. But that being said, it has its quirks. I'm going to start with the most normal of the stories, not normal because this happens all the time, but because there was no paranormal extraterrestrial Ooga Booga stuff. I was 13 at my sister's birthday party. My sister and I always celebrate our birthdays up there. My dad had to leave to take my sister's friends, who couldn't sleep over, back to their homes. My mom doesn't like to spend the night up there, so she had left before the sun went down. This left 13-year-old me with about 5, 10, or 11-year-old girls. In short, I was miserable. I was poking at the fire, planning on dropping some scary stories on them so that they would have nightmares when I heard a distinct rustling noise coming from the dry creek just ahead of us. 
I looked up from the fire and saw a figure approaching us. I told my sister to quietly get back to the cabin. She looked at me and was about to definitely say, Why? When she saw that my eyes were fixed on a singular point, she followed my gaze and not long after saw an old bearded man, wide-eyed, stumbling towards us. She screamed, prompting her friends to scream, and they all ran back to the cabin. The screaming stunned me, as I was sure that this man would now proceed to kill me, and after he was done, march to the cabin to finish off the girls. But that didn't happen. Instead, he stopped and just started mumbling. I could only make out a few words. Deers, rope, crick, and razor blades. Eventually, I gathered up the courage to tell him off. I let him know that if he didn't leave, he would be sorry. After I said this, I began backing towards the cabin and eventually retreated inside. We told my dad when he got back what happened, and he wasted no time gathering up people from the surrounding community. The old guy was caught, but not by police. He was caught by his daughter, who thanked my dad. I guess this guy was just a very old man with dementia who wandered out of his cabin and followed the road to ours, thinking it was one of the cutoffs to the creek. As for the razor blades, well, back in the 70s, a group of rednecks got tired of city people swimming in their creek, so on one of the rope swings, they attached razor blades. A bunch of kids cut their hands up. The rednecks were never caught, and all they managed to do was get every rope swing along the creek cut down. Ultimately, I feel more sad than scared when I remember this. However, this is only the first story I have from up there. The next one happened when I was 19. My first long-term relationship had just ended, and to say I was taking it hard would be an understatement. Fortunately, my childhood friend, who I will call Josh, was coming back to South Dakota from basic training. This was also around my birthday, so I had already gotten some days off work. There ended up being a ton of people going up there. So many, in fact, that there was no room for me to sleep inside the cabin. That wasn't an issue for me, though, as at the time, I drove a Subaru hatchback, and I had no qualms about sleeping in my car. I had a whole system. I blew up an air mattress, put down my back seats, slid in it, and I was off. The air mattress took up the entirety of my back seat and trunk, leaving no room for me to put my clothes while I slept. So I grabbed some hangers from the cabin and hung my clothes up on the inside handle of my trunk door. I kept the door open because I like the night air while I sleep, the weight and warmth of the blankets mixing with the general feeling of chill that came with the mountain night air was and still is very relaxing. I was even happier when it started to rain. However, that night I woke up with a strange feeling just kind of looming around me. I sat up and got a little disappointed at how deflated the air mattress had gotten before I started to hear the soft squishing noises of feet in mud and grass. I looked out the windows to see who was coming to scare me. I was naturally irritated and called out saying something to the effect of, I hear you, but no one made their presence known. I bit the bullet and threw the covers off me, hopping out of my car into the pouring rain. I looked around my car and didn't see anyone. I was confused and a little scared, but decided it was a good idea to just go back to sleep. As I wrapped myself back up, I began drifting off to the sound of raindrops, tapping the roof of my car. And then... As I was about to go to sleep, there was a loud thump that ripped me awake and sent me flying back up. It sounded as though someone had just slapped the back window of my car, and thus I didn't sleep the rest of the night. When the sun started to come up, I donned my clothes, which were somehow still dry, and began to search the surroundings. Sure enough, there were footprints around my car, and a single handprint on the back window. I thought about letting the group know, but decided against it, as they probably wouldn't believe me, even if I showed them the evidence, but also because I didn't want to ruin the weekend. The only one I told was Josh, 
who also said it was a good idea not to tell anyone else. He's a very spiritual person, and believed then, as he does now, that it was a ghost. However, I'm thinking it was a person who I will never know. First, let me set up some background to make the flow of the story smoother. This happened almost 19 years ago. I was nearly 13 years old, and I was being raised by my grandparents. We lived in a little tourist town in Florida. They had had problems with their two daughters as adults, my mother being the older of the two, and they wanted to do everything that they could to make sure that I didn't turn out the same way. A do-over, if you will. So needless to say, they were very strict. My aunt was having a good period. She had her stuff together. We were all very close. My aunt understood what it was like to be raised under a glass dome, metaphorically speaking. They raised her too, after all. So being as she was my only aunt, she made sure that the time we spent together was always super cool. I would stay over Saturday nights. We would go out and hang out at the pier, and she would let me hang out with my middle school boyfriend, who would find ways to get to wherever I was. My grandparents had no idea of any of these activities, of course. I was just spending some quality time with my aunt, and giving them a break. It was nice that I had a younger female figure, since my mom wasn't around. One night, when we were out having fun, my aunt meets this guy, and they really hit it off. He was very nice, and introduced himself to me. He went by JR, and at first, was a kind of charming talker. They exchanged numbers after hanging out a while, and then we went home and went to bed. They ended up going out a bit more, and my aunt had really liked JR. He took her to his house, and introduced her to his father, and showed her around his land. He lived out in the woods in the middle of nowhere. I have lived in this town for 30 years, and I still to this day couldn't tell you where it is. I was only there once. He was teaching my aunt how to shoot a gun. I remember her shoulder rocking back with the impact of the shot and it surprising her. He had these weird dancing clothes in his closet. It was all seemingly harmless. I mean, everyone has their quirks. About ten days, maybe two weeks later, we were again at the pier out by the payphones talking about what to do that night and what to get for dinner. JR and my aunt were in their late twenties, early thirties, and as much as she loved me, I imagine there were times that I got in the way. Well, anyway, we were at the pier, and he is talking about how he has these painkillers. He offered me one. I declined, of course, and told him I had a high tolerance to pain anyway, and didn't need that stuff. He then, with a huge smile, asks me if he can see for himself, assuring me that he won't really hurt me. He's just trying to have fun. This guy twists my arm behind my back, until I hear a pop. I start to cry, and he laughs and says, Ah, oh, sweetheart, I was only playing. You said you had a high tolerance. I guess I was stronger than I thought I was. I'm sorry. No need to ruin the good time we're having. I go in the private peer office, which my granddad managed, crying. My aunt comes in and lets me know that she thinks it's messed up too, and that she talked to him about it. She goes back outside, and he asks her what she is up to that night. She tells him that she isn't sure if I am staying over because with what just happened, I was whining about going home. I was pissed that she hadn't decked him right there for hurting me. Well, he tells her that she should meet him under, let's call, the Sunset Bridge at 2 a.m. on the other side of town. He says that the stars are beautiful, and you can listen and hear the fish. He tells her he would love to see it with her, and that they can dance under the moon. We were all from a fishing family, and live in a fishing town, so fishing activities under the bridge at late times wasn't necessarily something that threw up a red flag. If it's dark and late, there won't be people out there hogging all the fish. She tells him maybe, and we leave. I decide to spend the night after all, later sneaking in only if she will pick up my boyfriend Charlie. She calls him when she gets home, 
before we made our arrangement with Charlie, and says that she can come out, but she will have me with her. He groans and is like, Fine. All right, I guess. She can come too. Maybe she will get tired and sleep in the car. About an hour after she called JR the first time, I ask her about Charlie, and she agrees. She sits down with me and hugs me and touches my face lovingly, apologizing for what had happened with my arm. My aunt was an amazing woman, and I love her very much. She then calls him again and tells him not to worry. She is picking up Charlie, so I will have my own entertainment, and they can have their time. He goes into a rage and starts sputtering and cussing about how it's too complicated now, and he just wanted an intimate meeting with her not a quote-unquote family reunion. He went on about how he didn't want to have to babysit a 13-year-old kid and her 14-year-old boyfriend. He hangs up after calling her crazy. She bewilderingly hangs up the phone and tells me what happened. We go about our night with pizza rolls and PlayStation, and things are fine. He calls her a few more times and drives by the house for a couple of weeks, but my aunt was having none of it. After a while... He left our lives just as swiftly as he had come. That whole affair lasted only a month, if even that. Three weeks, maybe. And all in all, it wasn't the craziest experience she had with a man. JR was soon forgotten, and we went about our business. Fast forward two years later. I am almost out of middle school. My aunt had moved to a city about 40 miles away. I still lived with my grandparents. They were still strict, but as they had gotten older, so had I. I knew a few ways around the rules. One day my friend Frank and I missed the bus home from school and called our good high school friend Darla to pick us up and take us home after riding a bit. She had this big beautiful red truck, and I would ride around in the bed of it, loving the freedom and the wind. We were smoking cigarettes and laughing, listening to the radio. The time I would have spent on the bus before my stop was just enough time to hit up the taco drive through We cruised down the road a bit, before heading back to Frank and I's separate houses. He lived just down the road. We had a lot of fun that day. She dropped me off first. My grandparents came outside. They were heavily confused at the sight of an unknown vehicle, and even more so when they saw that I had gotten out of it. After letting her be the one to explain because she was older, cooler, and more responsible, my parents thanked her for being kind enough to take me home. They said how lucky I was that she had just happened to be there to help me get home. The things we do to our parents, eh? That was the last time we ever saw my friend. She didn't show up for work for five days. I can't speak for everyone, but I assumed that she had just run away. Darla's parents were going through a nasty divorce. The dad had a hot new girlfriend, and the mother was very bitter about it. Rightfully so, I guess. It was embarrassing for all of the kids. Her truck wasn't left behind. I figured she got tired of her parents acting like infants and took off. I missed her, but she was in a whole other league of freedom and coolness. Sixteen is a whole different life than fourteen especially when you are in different schools. I wished her well, maybe even a little envious that she got out of this town, and I was still here, and I hadn't heard anything for two weeks about her, when at about nine o'clock at night, my grandparents got a phone call to turn on the news. Darla's body was found in the woods. I was devastated. I was so joyful that I had that last experience with her, but so saddened and horrified. She was so young, barely older than myself. She was about to be 17 in just a short time. It was a very sad time for our town. The good and bad news is that they caught the guy that had done it. He confessed after some very incriminating evidence, and during his questioning, also confessed to killing his girlfriend, who had been missing for about eight years and also his father. When they showed his mugshot on the screen and said his name, I swear, I almost passed out. There, clear as day on the screen staring back at me, was a picture of J.R. I had no idea they even knew each other. I can't even imagine what would have happened 
if we had gone under that bridge that night. Investigation Discovery Channel did a piece on it a couple of years back. I was shocked to see it on the TV. The memories came rushing back, and I decided to write them all down. I literally have a newfound appreciation of life now, that I'm old enough to understand just how close I could have come to being killed. My aunt lived on to make awesome new memories with me. I have a beautiful life with my husband and three boys that most likely wouldn't have happened if things had gone differently that night. I am a private investigator living in the South. When people learn that about myself, it's usually met with a certain amount of interest given that TV has cast private investigators in a very intriguing light. In reality, our lives are usually mundane. More unremarkable vehicles and peeing in bottles than Ferraris and beaches. I haven't seen too many noteworthy or exciting things in my line of work. I have been rushed by a few dogs harassed by mentally unstable people, and busted plenty of times by an intended subject. But all in all, it's steady, boring work. But I do have one story that, for fear of sounding sensational, changed my life. It was January, a month that falls into what myself and my partners know is the dregs of the slow season. So when I got the call to work a fairly easy assignment about an hour and a half away from my home, I was pleased to have it. The assignment was just that. Scraps. A jiped and angry car lot owner who had spent too much patience attempting to locate a woman who he believed had skipped town in a less than paid off SUV. She's gotta be in that area. That's where the GPS last hit before it died. That's what I was told. It wasn't scandalous, high profile work, but I was happy to have it. The snow began to lightly fall as I loaded up my equipment bag into my car, stocked with spare camera batteries, snacks, and the like. I kissed my husband goodbye, zipped up my jacket, and plugged in a random address that fell within the last known latitude-longitude coordinates the client had provided from the last ping on the car's GPS. After nearly two hours of sipping coffee and half-heartedly dialing my radio back and forth, the channels crackled weakly as I drove further and further away from modern civilization and into the sprawling pastures of the rural back country. Finally, I found myself within the target area. Houses slowly became fewer and farther apart as I approached a long stretch of road. The roadway looked gloomy in the haze of the afternoon winter. Its length dipped and craned painfully on for what seemed like miles through farmland. I knew as I proceeded down it, slowly, that it would be a difficult area to set up on. I observed the sides of the road, devoid of any shoulder, and yielding abruptly from pavement to mucky, snow-soaked ditches. I quickly dismissed the idea of pulling off into the grass when I checked my phone and saw that I had no signal. This would be a bad area to get stuck in, with no reception, given that I had seen no houses for miles, and the snow only fell heavier by the hour. Turning around carefully, I drove back towards where I had come from, until a single, faint bar appeared in the corner of my cell phone screen. Using the weak signal, I consulted my map, and deduced that the long, desolate road I had come from connected two main highways, and I guessed that the SUV I was looking for was sure to be using it as a through way. Satisfied, but not convinced, I said goodbye to the idea of mindlessly browsing Facebook all evening and headed back to the area. The sleet sloshed beneath my tires as I slowed down outside of a small ranch-style home a little ways off the road at the end of a gravel drive. The house was somber, but looked charming with fresh snow settled on its worn roof. As I approached the house, the boards of the porch stoop, moaning under my boots. I knocked carefully and smiled immediately, so as to appear non-threatening to whomever answered the door. The latch on the other side of the door fell, and shortly after, the door opened. 
to my surprise, instead of being hit with the contrasting warm air of a home, I was enveloped by a musty cool draft that seemed to belch up from deep inside the house. Inside the doorway stood a man I gauged to be in his eighties. His eyes were brown and sad, and his face appeared weathered. His wrinkles set deep into his face, as if he had been carved out of the red clay soil that rested just inches below the snow outside. Even though he did not stand taller than myself, he still seemed to look down on me, his broad frame occupying most of the doorway. I smiled bigger, as if to prompt his own sober countenance to do so, but it did not. Awkwardly, I spoke. I hate to bother you, but I've come all this way to look for a car that I believe is in the area, and I was wondering if you would be okay with me sitting at the end of your driveway for a little while to keep a lookout. I had almost made an art out of playing up my innocent woman status for my own advantage, and I would be lying if I said that that wasn't what I was doing at this moment. He did not immediately answer. He looked at me, studying me, his face never warming and only serving to wear me down with silence. For a moment, I felt my damsel facade had finally fallen on unwilling ears, and I prepared myself for swift denial. But he just stood there, and that's when I took note of his clothing. A plaid shirt tucked into tan slacks ended in slick, black dress shoes, hardly what I would expect a gentleman of his age to be wearing in this weather, especially since his home didn't seem to be much warmer than the air outside of it. He clinched a blue wooden pipe between his teeth, chewing the tip thoughtfully. He looked terribly faint, almost jaundice, as if my palm might pass right through him if I offered him a hand to shake. Just at that moment, he seemed satisfied with how long he had studied me, and maybe having decided I wasn't a threat or trouble, he looked past me to my car, back down to me, and nodded his head in approval. I thanked him and was eager to retreat back to my warm car. Crunching snow and gravel beneath my tires, I caught one last look of his door shutting before I found an unimposing spot near the end of the driveway and began my surveillance. As a woman in this line of work, I have come to be aware of my environment. It's not my nature, and only came out of habit. Often looking into my rear and side view mirrors to check my surroundings, I took note of the man's house. It was dark. Even as the sun began to set, and darkness creeped into the valley, I never noticed any interior lights in the home. I suspected he may be entirely frugal, keeping as few lights on as possible. That also explained why his home was so cold. I smirked, remembering how my own father would keep a watchful eye on the thermostat so as to not prevent us kids who refused to put sweaters on from tinkering with the dial. Having seen only two sedans in the hours since I had arrived, I finally phoned it in and began my trek home. The next week passed by, and I once again loaded up my car for another assignment about an hour north of the man's home. I couldn't shake how sad he looked, and wondered whether or not he had anyone to care about him. His absent demeanor and sad, faraway eyes still occupied my mind every now and then. I scratched out a thank you note, bought a box of cookies, and decided that I would leave a little earlier so I could stop by and deliver them to him. I felt compelled to show my appreciation for him letting me, a complete stranger, take refuge on his property to do some scummy repo spotting work. By this time, the snow had melted, and the roads were far more formidable, albeit cold and damp. I made the familiar turn off the lonely stretch of road and slowly crunched down the driveway. To my surprise, I noted a new car parked near the home, as well as two utility trucks. A woman stood outside speaking with a man who donned tool belt and boots, making it easy to surmise his occupation. The woman motioned toward the house, speaking with her hands, and a worker appeared to consider whatever it was she was saying. 
She looked on at me, trying to place who I was as I stepped out. Calling out a greeting, I approached, with a letter and cookies tucked under my arm. I explained who I was and how I just wanted to say thank you to the man that lived there for his generosity, explaining that I would not have been able to do my job if not for him. I felt a twinge of embarrassment when I realized that I had never gotten the man's name. This woman studied me with the same eyes as the old man had, only hers seemed livelier and more skeptical. She told me in an almost accusatory tone that nobody should have been there and that she had only just come up from the north to begin renovating the home to sell. She looked on to the contractors with slight annoyance to which they both denied being responsible without actually being asked any questions. She looked back to me and explained that her father built the home in 1942 and lived there up until his death four years ago, leaving the house unoccupied since. She felt completely violated that someone had been squatting in her childhood home. I apologized out of sympathy while stifling my own fear and bewilderment that I may have been speaking to a crazy man who was eyeing me. She seemed reluctant to go on, so I offered up some feigned interest in her home's history in an effort to help her regain some of the autonomy she seemed to lose in light of finding out about the break-in. She walked me around the perimeter, telling me about an old sand pit she played in as a child and how she planned on making it into a garden. She continued through the tour explaining how she planned to repurpose and restore certain things. The memories seemed to warm her from the inside out, as if I began to disappear while she reminisced. I opened up the box of cookies and offered them to her as I got one out and bit it. I laughed as I offered her one. Here, old crazy doesn't deserve these. She forced a half-genuine laugh and took a cookie. She then reached into her back jeans pocket and pulled out an iPhone. Switching to the gallery, she opened an album of photos she had taken off old Polaroid pictures of the home in its former glory. She swiped up as she explained each and pointed out their original locations. A photo of her as a child sitting in her sand pit with an old family dog named Baba. A large knockout rose bush that had stood near the entrance years ago had been her mother's pride and joy, and she had spent hours each week pampering it. She swiped through more photos, an old pickup truck, her mother holding her infant brother on the stoop that had previously moaned under my boots, a chicken coop surrounded by heritage chickens, and finally, a photo of her father, a broad, weathered man, clutching a blue pipe in his teeth and grinning, warmly to the camera, wearing a plaid shirt, tucked into tan pants, ending in slick black dress shoes. A meter reader is the person who records how much electricity, gas, or water you've used each munch. You've used each munch. You've used each munch. You've, or, a, a meter reader is the person who records how much electricity, gas, or water you have used each munch. Oh my gosh. Or water you have used each munch.
Thank you.